Uh, my name is Yuan Ling and I'm co-hosting this session with Bettina then. Uh, the topic of my talk will be rock art, long distance maritime trade and social complexity in the Bronze Age Scandinavia. Uh, I work with rock art, I'm director for the Swedish Rock Art Research Archive, so therefore rock art stands very close to me, but also metal and metal trade. Uh, let's see, do, uh, here it is. Looking at the South Scandinavian rock art scene, what we have uh, here are the main areas. We have rock art dated to the Bronze Age, 700 to 500 BC. Altogether, during this phase, you shop in about 30,000 boats, I think, um, from this phase uh, in southern Scandinavia. And you can say the rock art is coming, staying, and vanishing with the Bronze Age here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the most dense area is uh, in West Sweden, um, Bokhusland, where we have 10,000 ships at 2,000 different localities and we constantly find more. The red dots here showing the distribution of the rock art. Um, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. Uh, anyway, the red dots show the distribution of the rock art and, and also uh, I illustrate here with the prehistoric uh, seashore line. Uh, so it pr it's pretty dense. Uh, in general, we can say that what we have on the panels then, uh, we have a predominance of panels found at coastal or maritime locations or former coasts. Uh, we have a predominance of ships or boats de depicted on the rocks. Predominance of performances of rituals on or in connection to the boats. And predominance of anthropomorphic beings brandishing weapons on the boats or in connection to the boats. We can also say that what you depict is, uh, in a sense, highly selective. You don't, you never make a house, you never make a mundane life. Uh, so it spans from, you can say, some highly ritualistic <coughs> features, often stage features, but also realistic in that sense that you depict the weapons that we have, you depict the boats that we, the probably they had, and, and the wagons and chariots and weapons, never monsters. Uh, as in the Viking Age, or freaky things. Uh, so they, they're kind of keen on depicting uh, <coughs> warriors in different stages uh, connected to the boats. In fact, if we speak about warrior uh, and what signifies the Bronze Age warrior, um, several scholars have argued for concept, and I have tried to conclude that. Uh, it's a guy into martial arts, he's a traveler trader, he's into metals, he's a hunter, he's a sportsman and a showman. Mm -hmm. And all this is highly pronounced on the rock art. Uh, you have here <coughs> the metal depicted, uh, swords one to one by the boats. Here you have a stage scene with warriors. Uh, here you have, have hunting scene maybe sportsmen and showmen here as well. So, warrior and warfare uh, is highly pronounced, but it's important to see them in this context. Uh, traditionally, you used to detach them from the boat and speak with warrior. They are calling now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's important to see that they are standing on the boats, by the boats, and have a strong connection and reference to the boats then, mm -hmm. um, from different periods then. Uh, we haven't found any uh, real boat from the Bronze Age in Scandinavia yet, um, but we have a boat from the pre-Roman Iron Age. It's a plank-built boat, same design as the uh, um, the ones from British Isles, you can say roughly, plank built soon. Um, and most scholars today argue that there's similarity between this Iron Age boat for 400 BC and, and the rock art is a strong indicating a long boat building tradition, probably going back to the Neolithic. So, you again, 
<laughs> uh, or late Neolithic, so in accordance with the ferry boats and, and, and that. Um, taking this um, Jutspring boat as an example, then, how you could travel uh, in Scandinavia during the Bronze Age, this uh, with good trained paddlers, you had Olympic paddlers uh, to taking this boat in a re reconstruction. And they, they, they could take it like 60 kilometers a day, but they said, give us a month, and we take it 80 to 100 kilometers in good weather. Easily, they said. Uh, and also, you could uh, load it with um, 20, 22 person, but also one tonnage uh, with goods. You had to load it with that to come down the water line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it has a high capacity in that sense. And that is important because in the Bronze Age, uh, we are importing metal. Uh, and actually, southern Scandinavia consume, you think, about one tonnage yearly of metal, of bronze, during this phase. In this region, we have found 2,000 swords from 1500 to 1100 BC. During this phase, we have outermost most swords in northern Europe. 20,000 objects from the Bronze Age in total. And the interesting thing is that the circulation of metal in Scandinavia correlates uh, with, or the peak uh, of circulation of metal correlates with, with the rock art, then, very strong. You make rock art in two phases, uh, in, in all phases in Bronze Age, but there are two phases you make more, and that's period two and period five. Uh, so it's strongly connected, connected to the metal trade, then, uh, and where metal is in, in, in large circulation. And we can see that in most of the regions, actually, from Norrköping to Uppland to Scania, uh, all through, and that, that you're updating uh, panels in period five that we started already in period two. Here are some of the representation here, for instance, a warrior probably holding a, a full hilted sword, and the sword and the boats here from Uppland. Here you have a pal stabs with <coughs> two boats. Um, sword wielders um, and also holding shields, probably representing flame shielded swords and different kinds of sword types, um, and probably arm, armor here as well. In period five, <coughs> uh, also you see the warriors, you see also fighting scenes um, opposing one and each other. And, and real one-to-one -one killing scenes, so you will call them what, what you want. And one important thing is, I stressed that before, we don't have copper, we don't extract copper in Scandinavia. We have had projects showing perfectly uh, that no evidence of prehistoric mining in Scandinavia. Uh, uh, the closest mines are in Central Europe and on the British Isles. So we are depending on external sources. And uh, actually, we've been working pretty long in trying to provenance Scandinavian metals uh, from the Bronze Age, pointing to different areas during different phases. In the early, our early Bronze Age, 2000 to 1500 BC, we mostly get metal from the East Alpine region. Then about 1500 to 1100 BC, we get it mostly from Italian Alps. And then from about 1200 BC, uh, Iberia comes in the picture, uh, which is not strange. Here I show an isotopic plot. Uh, here is the Italian Alps signatures. Here is Iberian signatures. And our artifacts are, are matching here then. And it's not surprising because Iberia is, uh, has the largest and richest copper and tin ore fields in Europe, and one of the world's largest, and specifically down here in Huelva region. Um, so we argue that there is an Atlantic connection then in the late Bronze Age, where actually Scandinavia also connects, uh, where, where you can also see the archaeological material, the Harrisburg shields that we have. In Scandinavia, you have the ones on the British Isles, you have the ones depicted on the rock art, and in Spain, you have Baltic amber, you have pearl stabs of typical 
Spanish types going all the way up to Sweden, actually, at least one. Mm -hmm. and, and, and other features that connects Scandinavia to an Atlantic network in the late Bronze Age. Uh, more concrete evidence of, of groups interacting in, in the Atlantic, you can say it's on, from the evidence here in Cliff's End, uh, on this Isle of Tanit, where you have performed, have made excavations and uh, on basis of storm human uh, oxygen isotope can show that some of the individuals there are Scandinavian from late Bronze Age, no doubt in the signatures, most are local from Kent, but you also have groups from the West Mediterranean world. There you find bun ingots, Baltic amber, and other interesting aspects showing uh, uh, that there's a big trade going on, uh, interesting enough, between probably between Iberia uh, and the British Isles, uh, and Scandinavia in some sense. I should also stress that during some phase also, British materials show consistency with Iberian ores. This was already stressed by Roland Neiman uh, back in 1998. Um, well, uh, anyhow, we don't think you, you went to Iberia all the way, uh, mostly the Scandinavians. Probably what, what, you what you do with this boat is that you go from, for instance, from Denmark to the miles of the river system in northern Germany that you do in a couple of days. You could, of course, also go to the British Isles. It would take you like 10 to 12 days uh, in a good weather situation. It's nothing to meet up the metal that's coming up here uh, through different networks then. And uh, the question is then, how was this organized? And now I'm coming into the one of the topic here that we're probably going to discuss in the end aspects on social complexity and long-distance trade. Uh, it's a classical thing that control of long-distance trade uh, is a fundamental feature for, for development of social complexity. Uh, you can follow that from Malinovsko's work in the Pacific, for instance. Uh, you can further that with Matthew Spriggs and Earl's work in Pacific or Gene Arnold, that there is a correlation between uh, the groups that invest in long-distance trade in boats and crew, that that butters social complexity and social stratification. And that Bronze Age elite benefits from that. Classical thing in, in Chumash is that they went out with, with boats and said, pay up. Mm -hmm. uh, the boats was, was a social space, demanding space, but also a control mechanism. And the people on the boat, if you can organize them, if you can control them, you control the trade. And so the ability to fund boat construction and distance travel would have provided a new control mechanism based on ship ownership. And we think that uh, in the Bronze Age land in Scandinavia, that what households do is they invest in boats and crew, and, and thereby. Um, that is the qualitative step that triggered the rise of what we call maritime institutions and politics in Scandinavia and, and, and leads to expansion of the households then. Then they can take in metal, they can, uh, in a different sense, though those families that do this investment, so to speak. Also, and finally, being a warrior in a maritime environment most likely would have involved various uh, initiation rituals and preparation and connections to sea voyages. And we see very much the rock art in, in, in that context. Uh, we can go back to Malinovsky's work, um, you know, maritime rites before a journey and a connection with a journey after a journey. But uh, you articulate probably journeys uh, while doing the rock, rock art. They, on board these boats, they were forced to know navigation and ship propulsion fighting skills, trade etiquettes, knowledge about precious metals and craftsmanships and customs expressions and practices. How did you trade that or how did you um, go on with that knowledge to other groups, so to speak? What is the time? Okay. So I will conclude here that 
Bronze Age witness an emergence of social stratification based on the engagement and investment in control of perceived goods and long-distance trade. The use of water transport would have created a need for significant capital investment in boats and the specialized sailors and warriors to, and man to protect them. The importance of warriors locally would have required incre uh, increased engagement with the metal trade then. And we have, as I showed, expansion in rock art during the phases where we take in most metal in two and five. And also in those phases, you can see the warriors are appearing on the rock art in a different sense. They take different shapes. And we argue, at least some of us, that the rock art should, could be a medium for the Bronze Age maritime warrior traveler trader. Thank you.